This video is sponsored by Raycon. So it goes without saying that these days our screen time has definitely skyrocketed. Personally, I've been making an effort to change that and Raycon's everyday E25 earbuds have been my go-to tool to get my eyeballs away from screens. Like I've said before, the E25s are great for stuff like exercising, tuning the world out while on the bus, etc. But sometimes it's also a good idea to just take a moment to disconnect from the news and all the other chaos that we might be scrolling through. Whether it's a meditation podcast, or an educational audiobook, these earbuds will not let you down, especially considering their six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and noise isolating fit. If you're interested in saving your eyes and or your sanity, then you can also save 15% by heading over to buyraycon.com slash rainbot. Again, that's buyraycon.com slash rainbot for 15% off your first order. And with that said, let's begin. Tonight's case begins with a 23-year-old Ashton Kutcher. At this point, Kutcher had become a household name given his standout role as Kelso from That 70s Show, and by all accounts, things seemed to be looking up for the young star. On the evening of February 21st, 2001, however, things changed. Kutcher was set to attend a Grammys after party with his then-girlfriend, 22-year-old fashion student Ashley Ellerin. The pair had planned to meet up at approximately 8 p.m., but Kutcher was running late. At about 7.30, he called Ashley's residence to let her know that he wasn't going to make it on time, only to be called back instead by Ashley's roommate, who told Kutcher not to worry since Ashley was still getting ready herself. Around 8.24 p.m., Ashton called again just to make sure that their plans for that night were still on, this time speaking to Ashley directly. All seemed to be going as planned minus the timing issue, but when Kutcher called again at around 10 p.m. to let Ashley know he was en route, he for some reason received no answer. Roughly half an hour later, Kutcher arrived at Ashley's place and, still not having heard back from her, simply knocked on her door. Again, no answer. At this point, the young man assumed that Ashley was angry at him for being late. Maybe she just wasn't answering the door, or maybe she even decided to go out with her roommate instead, despite the lights being left on. By this point, the two were newly established, and it was safe to assume that anyone would be annoyed if their date turned up several hours later than planned. So at the time, this didn't seem like all that big of a deal. As one last check, Ashton appeared into Ashley's window, and that's when he saw something a bit peculiar. He saw what appeared to be spilt red wine on the carpet. Again, this was odd, but not necessarily anything alarming, especially given that the neighborhood was relatively crime-free. With Ashley nowhere in sight, Kutcher decided to leave, and maybe that was for the best. Had Kutcher somehow found his way in that night, he would have happened upon a gruesome discovery. The next morning, at approximately 9 a.m., Ashley's roommate, who'd spent the night away, returned home. And that's when she found Ashley, or rather, Ashley's body. She was lying on the floor just outside the entrance of the bathroom, covered in multiple stab wounds, her blood pooling on the floor and soaking into the carpet. By 9.28 a.m., Ashley Ellerin was pronounced dead. Needless to say, this visceral crime shook the upper echelons of LA, to whom this sort of thing usually never happened, and naturally, the connection to a celebrity only made the story bigger. What made this even more shocking was that they had no idea who was responsible, and there weren't any signs of forced entry. Keep in mind, Kutcher saw nothing he considered to be out of the ordinary, even though, chillingly, what he mistook for spilled wine was actually his girlfriend's blood. As the years went by, Ashley's family would plead for answers that felt like they'd never come. One year after another would pass, with still no answers being brought forward as to who was responsible for this. Nearly a decade would pass, and then suddenly, a breakthrough. One that would unfortunately come at a grim cost. This section of the story brings us to Santa Monica, California, 2008, roughly 25 miles away and eight years after Ashley's death. There, at around 10.30 p.m., a 26-year-old woman by the name of Michelle Murphy had gone to bed. But not long after, she found herself awake and struggling for her life. An unknown male in a hoodie and baseball cap was on top of her, plunging a knife into her chest, shoulders, arms, and just about anywhere else he could before Murphy managed to kick him off. 
For whatever reason, this made the attacker give up, pleading I'm sorry as he fled the scene. Michelle was severely injured and undoubtedly mentally scarred, but would ultimately survive this ordeal, and when it came time for authorities to investigate, they realized that they had the attempted killer's DNA. He managed to accidentally cut himself during the assault, and this was more than enough for police to pin down their perp. Several weeks later, a 32-year-old air conditioner repairman by the name of Michael Thomas Gargiulo was arrested for the attempted murder of Michelle Murphy. And once she'd heard that name, she came to a shocking realization that would ultimately help expose the scope of Gargiulo's crimes. As it turns out, Michelle knew this man. She just didn't realize it the night of the attack. The two were actually neighbors. When looking into Gargiulo's residential history, a disturbing trend became apparent. It seemed that wherever the man moved, a woman nearby would end up mysteriously murdered in cold blood. And yes, that does include Ashley Ellerin. Back in 2001, Gargiulo actually lived near Ashley and even knew her. The two met when Gargiulo helped Ashley with a flat tire, after which he left her his business card for his AC repair services. This familiarity, many assume, is why there weren't any signs of forced entry. Ashley knew this man, and presumably opened the door when he knocked. Interestingly enough, Gargiulo was actually named as a person of interest by Ashley's friends, who referred to him as, quote, Mike the Furnace Man. This, however, was not enough to get him caught. Now, of course, as I just mentioned, Ashley and Michelle Murphy weren't Gargiulo's only two victims. Back in 2005, Gargiulo was still living in the confines of Los Angeles when he noticed a new female neighbor who'd moved in nearby. Her name was Maria Bruno, a 35-year-old mother of four who was unfortunately living alone following a family separation. On the night of December 15, 2005, Maria was stabbed to death by Gargiulo in her sleep, and her body subsequently mutilated. At the time of the initial investigation, there once again seemed to be little to go off of in terms of evidence or clues, as all that was found at the scene was a blue surgical slipper stained with Maria's blood. Years later, similar footwear would be uncovered. According to CBS's 48 Hours, after Gargiulo's arrest, a search of his property revealed more of the blue slippers, something the man apparently wore while on the job as a repairman. Now, this brings us back to Gargiulo's first victim, but unlike the others mentioned so far, this story does not take place in California. It's believed that the now-dubbed Hollywood Ripper actually got his start back home in Chicago. In 1993, an 18-year-old high school student by the name of Trisha Picasso was spending a night out with friends before separating from the group at approximately 1 a.m. Trisha was supposed to be going back home, but she never made it there alive. The next morning, she was found dead at the front steps of her family home, her body covered in multiple stab wounds. As you already guessed, Gargiulo did know Tracy. In fact, the two were neighbors, and he drove her to a friend's house the night before, and because of this was actually questioned by police during the initial stages of the investigation, but in the end, he was let free. Although already formally charged for the murders of Ashley Ellerin, Maria Bruno, and the attempted murder of Michelle Murphy, Gargiulo was still technically off the hook for the murder of Trisha Picasso. That is, until 2011. Following the 48 Hours episode on the Hollywood Ripper, some former co-workers of Gargiulo came forward recounting a rather strange statement made by the man in the 2000s when he worked as a bouncer in West Hollywood. The men were goofing off and asked each other if they'd ever killed a person, to which Gargiulo said he had. He mentioned murdering a woman and leaving her, quote, on the steps for dead. This was obviously taken as a joke at the time and never reported. Now, I should add that back in 2003, local authorities had reopened Trisha's case and decided to gather DNA samples for their investigation. Gargiulo's DNA was in fact a match for DNA found under Trisha's fingernails, but shockingly enough, this still was not enough to pin him down. 
According to Oxygen, quote, the Cook County State Attorney's Office declined to indict Gargiulo for the murder, citing that his DNA could have been transferred to Trisha through casual contact when they were together in the car before her death. Now, that is obviously frustrating, but once Gargiulo was exposed as the Hollywood Ripper, his DNA, plus the testimony from his former co-workers, was too much to be ignored. And in 2011, he was formally charged for the murder of Trisha Picaccio. Keep in mind, I said charged and not convicted, but let me clarify that. Gargiulo wouldn't be found guilty for the murders of Maria Bruno and Ashley Ellerin until another decade later, finally being formally convicted of his crimes in California following a 2019 trial in which Ashton Kutcher was heavily involved as a witness. As things stand right now, Gargiulo is still awaiting sentencing and will ultimately have to face another trial back in Illinois, but the time frame for that is up in the air, with no one really knowing when it'll happen. One can only hope that this leads to a formal conviction for Trisha's death, even if we're already almost three whole decades past it. This video was edited by Darkfire Productions, written and researched by Lux Noctis, with additional writing and research by yours truly. As always, I'd like to thank every single one of my lovely supporters on Patreon, but especially the following people. T. Gorman, Connor H., Base of Shadow, W.H., Anthony, Jamie P., Dimitri L., Millie B's, which is Alice, Ronnie, TBF, Saul A., Mishy Mishy, Mishy Mishy, did I say that right? Guilty Pleasures, Corey Barks, Corky Barks. I've been saying your name wrong for a long time, have I not? David G., Catherine L., KMBK Ketchup, PD Gun, Astro, Tyler T., Bloody the Elf, Andrew L., Esper Nix, Sean the CHB, Eric M., Brandon F., LC, Daniel G., AJ Runaway, Ulysses, the Deck of Cards, Daniel P, Panda Tiger, The Man in the Crowd, what a name, Deja, Echo Steel, Clifford S, Mega Brutal, S Christine, Eddie, Terry the Outlaw, Pen Stift, Kyle R, Chris R, Bath Time Duck, Zimbledorf the Calzone Consumer, Rye S, Francisco B, Skygrinder, Elon Musk Musk, Elon Musk Musk. Musk. I know that this is the guy who used to have the Mitt Romney name, but he changed it, I think. Luck B, Scorian S, Nick B, Melody S, P, C, Zippo, Keith Z, Matt J, James M, and Zarai. Again, thank you guys so much, and if you're still listening right now, you're insane, but I love you. I'll see you guys next time.